Welcome everyone to the last A16Z Crypto Research Seminar uh, of the week. Last but not least, we have Nilesh Pai. Um, Nilesh is an economist at Rice University. Um, he'll tell us about the wisdom of the crowds and higher over beliefs and maybe a little bit about decentralized oracles. Awesome. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, those of you online can hear me. So. Uh, I, I want to start with uh, a disclaimer, which is the talk I'm giving is not directly related. I, I don't have in mind a direct set of applications for the kind of things I'm proposing. Um, why am I presenting this? Well, this has sort of been a hobby horse, uh, broadly construed of mine, for the last few years uh, as a game theorist or economist, understanding the economics of expertise. So people have. Uh, there, are, there are these people, they call themselves experts, they claim to know something more about uh, the underlying unknown state of the world than the regular population. And for various reasons, you might be interested in evaluating their expertise, aggregating their expertise. Today, I'm going to drill down in a, into a very specific setting, but uh, uh, that, that's sort of one set of questions I've been thinking a lot about over the past few years. In a Web3 setting, there are several settings, I'm told, uh, reliably by people in this room over the course of this week where you might want to aggregate diffuse information. So one that came up was aggregating the opinions of backers in a DeFi uh, lending setting. Or uh, I'm going to caricature one that I thought I understood a little bit better before coming here, which is oracles and smart contracts. So let me tell you my caricature of it, and you can tell me I'm all wrong. So a smart contract, as far if, if, as an economist, if I was modeling it, all I'd say is it's a, something that's trying to implement different outcomes based on an unknown input, an input that isn't known at the time of writing down the smart contract. Something else is pot potentially going to come in and is going to be a relevant variable. This input is not potentially something that's even on chain. So you need these people, oracles, these uh, other gadgets that are going to provide the input so that the smart contract can function. And if you're going to be relying on things that are off-chain, you want to understand the incentives of these oracles, what can be manipulated, what can be aggregated, what can you do with the information from these oracles, and you want to understand that so you can expand the set of contracts you write in the first place. Sometimes we're talking about oracles that are reporting some state of the world that in principle is commonly known or understood off-chain. So the outcome of a sports event is something that everyone knows, it's just that the chain doesn't know it. That's not the kind of setting that uh, this talk will immediately uh, correspond to. But in other cases, even the oracles might have only noisy information about the state of the world that you're trying to condition on. So you're trying to write a contract, for example, on uh, the price of something, and no particular oracle knows the price but they all know noisy versions of those prices. They're sampling different AMMs, they're sampling different exchanges. What can we do? How can we get uh, sort of this disparate information and aggregate it in a way that's... Um, big? So that's my high-level pitch for why you should pay attention if you don't care about the underlying techniques. Okay. All right. And now... Uh, all right. So I'm just going to launch into a formal model. This is not a high-level overview talk. Uh, it's, it's a very specific model. So the idea is that there is an unknown state of the world. Nobody knows it. It's not something that uh, will be revealed at any stage. But there are agents, experts, oracles, if you must. There's a lot of them, so we're going to rely on large number theorems, who observe some information about that state. They observe that information, and what they observe, or not what they observe, but kind of the distribution of information, how it's distributed among these agents is known among the agents themselves, but not known to the aggregator. So the question is, how well, or can I, identify this unknown state of the world when there are a bunch of agents who know something, they know what each other, they have information about what each other know, but I want to design a prior free, um, I want to design a mechanism that does not condition on the settings of what they know. Uh, they just, uh, I, I want to do as well, or can I do as well as a Bayesian aggregator who actually knew the underlying prior, who knew the underlying information structure, and how well can I do relative to that? Okay? So here's the motivating example for why the obvious thing you'd think, like take the majority, is uh, not good. So this is sort of, 
this is due to a paper by Pralek, Seung, and McCoy. And the question they ask people, I'll, I'll keep re returning to this paper, but just the question they ask people is, is Chicago the capital of the state of Illinois? Um, yes or no? And uh, in case you didn't know, it is not the capital of Illinois. Um, so the truth, the true underlying state of the world is that Chicago is not the capital of uh, Illinois, but in lab experiments, you poll a bunch of people on the street, people will say yes. Not only will people say yes, but um, if you ask them how confident are you, everyone who says the answer is Chicago is super confident that the answer is Chicago. So waiting, the, uh, waiting for instance, the votes by some self-reported confidence score is not going to help you fix the problem. Okay? So the question then is, when we have just a bunch of experts, we're not, for now, don't worry about them trying to manipulate the outcome. We're just trying to, they have information about whether or not Chicago is the state of the world. We're trying to, uh, Chicago is the capital of Illinois. We're trying to learn, is Chicago the capital of Illinois? Uh, but majorities can be wrong. Can we still aggregate that information and how? Okay. Um, I'm going to propose a procedure. Uh, population-based mean aggregation that uh, fully aggregates inf agents' information uh, in this setting. So if you actually gave me a large number of agents, I can be very sure that this procedure will work in, uh, within the context of our model. And the main innovation of this procedure is that it's going to be, um, is that it's going to allow not just for questions of the sort, is Chicago the capital of Illinois, but also multiple state questions. So is Chicago the capital of Illinois, or is Springfield the capital of Illinois, or is Urbana the capital of Illinois? Like, so uh, there is a mechanism out there which I will review, which is actually very clever and very interesting. It's called the surprisingly popular mechanism. It's a surprisingly nice mechanism, if you will, uh, that does it. And once we've sort of covered the mechanism, uh, I, I, I'll sort of show you also that it's not just that you can use this mechanism to aggregate the state of the world, you can also use this to truthfully incentivize uh, elicitation of the underlying beliefs, even though you'll never learn a true state. So you couldn't use a scoring rule uh, straight up because you don't know the capital of Chicago, you're trying to aggregate that information to learn it in the first place, okay? So that's sort of the high level pitch. If there are any questions, um, otherwise I'll soldier on. Okay, so here is just a simple formal model. We're gonna have a set of states of the world omega. There's gonna be L possible states of the world. And there's gonna be a bunch of agents. So I'm just going to formally only consider the case of an infinite set of agents. You can imagine laws of large numbers would give you good concentration and good properties even with a finite set. What's known to the agents, uh, unknown to the aggregator, is the following. Each of these agents is going to observe some signal. That signal is going to be information to them about the state of the world. There's some joint prior over the state of the world times the signal the agent sees conditional on the state of the world, and that's denoted by P. This P is understood by the agents. So agents understand, at least probabilistically, what information other people also have. If I see a signal, I know something about Andy's signal. Oh, yeah. Um, does the aggregator know the marginal along omega, or not even that? Not even that. So the aggregator knows, all the aggregator knows is, is he's willing to buy the common prior that the, that the agents are sort of understanding the thing. And we can relax that too later, but that's, that's going to be the thing. What agents are going to have then, of course, because they start with this prior P, if agent I saw a signal SI, the agent I is going to update to some prior mu I, and that prior mu I is going to live in the space of probability distributions over six. And one more piece of notation, I'm going to define, given a prior, assuming concentration holds, for instance, if the signals are IID across agents conditional on the state, there is going to be a un, there is going to be a state by state average population belief when the true underlying state is omega, and I'm going to de define that as mu bar omega. Again, the um, the principle, the aggregator does not know any of these things. They just know that there is a p. 
Okay? The question then is, if there is such a set of agents, if I knew P, of course I could learn back the true underlying omega just by, uh, I know P, it's, if I ask all the agents for their signals, I know an infinite set of signals that are drawn from some distribution, I can back out what the state must be. The question is, what could I do if I didn't know P and had to do something? Okay. Assuming that each pair of distinct states induces distinct calculations. Sorry? Assuming that each distinct pair of states induces distinct calculations. For instance, you could do that straight up. If I knew the, uh, if I knew the P, I, I could do that. Even if it in, induced different population averages, if it induced a different quartile and some, you know, the mean is not the only thing I could check if I knew P. I could check a whole bunch of things. In particular, I could just check the whole distribution of posteriors and compare it against. Uh... All right. So here's the here's an example just to walk you through everything that happens. And here is also the surprisingly popular mechanism of uh, Prelek, Seung, and McCoy explained uh, within the context of a specific example. So let's suppose we have the two states. Omega 1 is the capital of Illinois. Omega 2 is uh, that Chicago is not the capital of Illinois. And of course, Omega 2 is the true state. We don't know it. This is the, this is the specification of the priors. So agents are going to see a conditionally IID signal. Everyone starts with the belief that Chicago is likely to be uh, the state of Illinois, uh, the capital of Illinois with 0.7 probability. Uh, Chicago is not the capital with 0.3. And they see these signals. So this is the probability of seeing, sorry, this is the probability, this is the posterior that you have upon seeing signal one. This is the posterior that you have upon seeing signal two. So this is the conditional probability an agent would update to given their states. Conversely, this is the probability of seeing a particular signal in a particular state. You can work out the population average beliefs that must be occurring in the population when a given state is the true state. So if omega 1 was the true state, then the population average beliefs, if you work through the math, it would be 5 7 and 2 7. If uh, 2 thirds, uh, if, if uh, Chicago was not the capital, then it would be two third and one third. So this is the model that's known, um, understood among the agents, not known among, um, not known by the uh, aggregator. And here is uh, the surprisingly popular mechanism. It's really easy to describe. So we ask every agent, what are your beliefs about the state of the world? That's great. I can calculate. Um, I can calculate. Once I ask them all for their average, uh, all for their beliefs, I can calculate the average belief by a law of large numbers. The average belief in the population when the state is omega must be the true underlying uh, average mu bar of omega. It's just that I don't know what the mu bar of omega should be state by state. Now note that this is by itself, this is not, uh, just if I knew this, it doesn't tell me what the uh, state of the world is, because even if I understood the signal structure among agents for two different priors, so for the prior 0 0.7, 0 0.3, the population average belief when Chicago is not the capital will be two-third, one-third. But if agents started with the prior 36 over 55 and 19 over 55, then two-third, one-third would be the population average when Chicago was indeed the capital. So if you don't, even if you have an infinite number of agents, and even if all of these agents are getting a IID signal, without knowing the prior, the aggregator is uh, facing an identification problem. What's the um, sort of trick that PSM introduced? They say, you, suppose we don't just ask agents about their beliefs, but we also ask at least one agent about their expected population average belief. So you ask them, what do you think? You, you don't just ask them, what do you believe Chicago is, you know, do you believe Chicago is the capital of Illinois with what probability? You also ask at least one agent, what do you think will be the average probability that 
all the participants in this poll will submit. Is there some reason we can't ask them about the bias? So that's a bit of a epistemic question of can you ask people about what their priors would have been before they saw any information. So we normally don't like to assume that people can go back to what they would have felt was the underlying prior before they saw information. People exist knowing the information that they know. It's hard for them to back out that thing. You're right. I mean, in some sense, there's a trivial solution to this question. Uh, just generalizing further, I could just ask one of the agents, tell me this whole distribution P. And then, thank you, now I'm going to calculate this. What I'm trying to propose is uh, things that you might be able to work in practice. And I'm shockingly actually going to have data at the end. Uh, well, Prelek, Seng, and McCoy actually ran experiments showing that their mechanism works well in practice on a bunch of lab experiments. Uh, it's worked well in the field. I'm going to show evidence using their data that our mechanism also works well in, on, on, on their practice, to, to be fair, because they haven't run out. Okay. So what's their mechanism? You ask one agent for, the expect for their expectation of the population average belief. So what do you think is the expected, uh, you're not sure what the population average belief is because you don't know what it is in society, but uh, you have some belief about it, so tell me what your expectation of the population average belief is. So for instance, if the agent, the agent understands that in state one, the average belief in the population would be 5727. The agent understands that in state two, the uh, average would be two third, one third. If they saw signal one, their beliefs are 0 0.6, 0 0.4. So of course they would report points uh, if they were faithfully doing reporting their expectation of population average beliefs, they would report 0 0.695, 0 0.305. Similarly, if, agent, if the same agent instead saw signal two, they would have reported this, 0 0.705, 0 0.205, uh, 295, based on their weighting, the, the other information they have, and this, that uh, effective weighting. In either case, note that in the true state of the world, Chicago is not the capital of Illinois, the true population average belief is two-third, one-third, the uh, average belief that results in the population. So when you ask this agent, what do you think the average should be? They say, well, regardless of what information they see, they either say that Chicago should be the cap uh, Chicago is not the capital of Illinois on average among the population with probability 0 0.305 or with probability 0 0.295. Whereas in truth, the average in the population comes out to be one third. So in both cases, with respect to that agent, Chicago, is, uh, Chicago not being the capital of Illinois is surprisingly popular. Prelex, Seung, and McCoy mechanism just says the uh, surprisingly popular state of the world, that is where there is one state of the world out of two, where the actual realized average beliefs in the population exceeds one person's elicited expectation of the population average in the population. That's what you call surprisingly popular, and they assert that that is the true state of the world. Well, they, don't, they prove it. I mean, uh, so this is, this is not just uh, heuristic. You can give a straightforward reason for why this, is, why this must be true. Okay. It doesn't matter which agent you ask. It doesn't matter which agent you ask. So uh, that's a great question. Why is it that it doesn't matter with what agent you ask? Here's a theorem. I, I, I haven't seen. They, they have a different proof. Um, there's a simpler uh, theorem that is uh, true. So in a two-state setting with two or more signals, for any agent i, the induced belief on omega, that's a random variable, in state omega, first order stochastically dominates the induced belief on omega at any other state omega prime. Your belief on omega is a random variable. That you will have some distribution of that. In state omega, you'll have one distribution. In state omega prime, you'll have a different distribution of the belief you place on the state of the world being state omega. The former first order stochastically dominates the latter. So when you aggregate up, the because you're just averaging a bunch of first order stochastically dominant distributions, uh, the average belief of the true state always has to be surprisingly popular for any agent, no matter whom you ask. Now, some things I should note. 
I, uh, the original Prelex Seung and McCoy also works if you, at the first order, you don't just ask people for beliefs on what is your belief that Chicago is the capital of Illinois. You could just ask them, is Chicago the capital of Illinois or not? And elicit just a second order belief about what you think the fraction of the votes is. That works too in the original mechanism. It works very well in practice for binary states. I'll show you the data in a little bit. Or I'll show you the data right at the end because I'm a theorist. And, but, uh, um, but the issue with uh, the surprisingly popular mechanism is that for more than two states of the world, you need very strong assumptions. So there is no counterpart to this first order stochastically dominance, uh, first order stochastic dominance relationship if you have more than two states of the world. This only works for two states. Um, what does that mean, the like, FOSD? Like for distributions, what's the actual definition there? What's the actual definition of first order stochastically dominant? It means you put a lower probability. The probability with which you put it, so a distribution over probability distributions is just a probability distribution on the real line between zero and one. It means a first order, one distribution, first order stochastically dominates another distribution if it puts lower probabilities on any lower interval. So you look at any given x, the probability distribution one takes a value less than x, is smaller than the distribu probability distribution two uh, takes a value, uh, the random variable generated from distribution two takes a value less than x. So your first order stochastic dominance just means that you are evenly likely to, you are, uh, regardless of where you look in the distribution, the first distribution is more likely to give you a higher number than the second distribution. The CDF is strictly above the others. Well, it has to catch up, but it's strict. Uh, so the first order stochastic dominance is strictly below because it, the survivor function is strictly above. Yeah? Yeah. And then, uh, so even if you ask many people instead of just one person about their beliefs, this would still not help? Yeah, you, there's no benefit in particular in this mechanism to asking multiple people. You could, uh, because you, just, you could, of course, take multiple people, average them, and look at what is surprisingly popular. The theorem is still true. Well, for more than two states, I meant. Ah, with more than two states, um, very non-knife edge examples start to break down. So here is an example. I'm just putting it up here. I do not want to walk you through this entire set of numbers. But it's an example sort of where you can just calculate. Again, we're not doing anything. We're not adding anything else. So it's still a prior. There's still unconditional. Uh, there's still IID sig conditionally IID signals, you're still calculating posteriors, you're still calculating population average beliefs. The trouble is that when you then run this mechanism, you could have multiple surprisingly popular states. Because with, when you're comparing two numbers that sum to one with another two numbers that sum to one, only one of them can be surprisingly popular. But when you have three numbers that sum to one versus three other numbers that sum to one, two of them could be surprisingly popular. Indeed, this is the set of surprisingly popular states. Uh, if you tried and did something like most surprisingly popular, that's not going to be correct either. I'm not saying that this couldn't work in practice, but at least theoretically, you'd have to make very strong uh, diagonal dominance assumptions of basically in state one, something has a uh, strong enough, uh, uh, there's enough dominance on the diagonal to guarantee that something like most surprisingly popular works. Yeah. Could you know, just ask multiple questions? You Sorry? Down. Could you know, just ask multiple questions? You break it down into multiple one and two. Ah, so you can't ask multiple questions. You, you might say, tell me whether the state is omega one or omega two, omega three. Note that this mechanism relies on the fact that conditional on a given state of the world, the uh, population average is deterministic or close to deterministic. When I have two states of the world that I lump into one underlying state of the world from the pers perspective of the question, the population average condition on my question state of the world is random because it depends on what the actual uh, resolved state of the world is, right? So if I ask, is Chicago the capital of Illinois or is it Urbana or uh, whatever. I can't resolve the question of whether it's Urbana or Spring, uh, conditional on the state of the world being Urbana or Springfield, the av population average distribution is going to be a stochastic variable. It's, it's, 
you see what I'm saying? All right, so that's the mechanism. That's their uh, beautiful mechanism. Let me tell you our theorem. Here's the assumptions. So the assumptions, uh, for, the, for now, just imagine that the signals are still conditionally IID. Uh, we can generalize this substantially. We need, going back to Tim's assumption, we are going to assume that the, probabil the prior, the probability distribu generating distribution is such that in any two states of the world, the population average is different. If you had some reason to think that population averages might be the same, but you could pick some other quantile that was different, you could work with that and that would be fine. And the most tricky one, perhaps, to describe, but you'll see where I'm using it because this is an embarrassingly simple mechanism to describe, is that what I want is that the support of the priors that people have in the population is a full support set. It has an interior relative to the set of priors on delta L. So it's not the set, it's not the state, uh, like it's not the case that the state, there are three states, but all possible priors in the population lie along a single line. Okay? And I'll show you some simple examples that generate that. So here's the example again. Here's uh, two states of the world. Chicago is capital. Chicago is not capital. Again, agents are going to see a conditional EID signal. These were the distributions. Now, let me tell you the question that we're going to ask that is slightly different, or how we're going to do it that's slightly different than um, uh, Prelex, Young, and McCoy. So remember that by a law of large numbers, when we know in the state of the world that Chicago is not the capital of Illinois, the average belief in the population is going to average out to two-third, one-third. That we know. We just, when we see two-third, one-third, we don't know how to interpret it. We don't know whether that's coming from because Chicago is the capital or uh, Chicago is not the capital. And like I showed you a few slides back, for two different priors, two-third, one-third could have been the population average for the same signal distribute for the same signal, conditional signal information, for two different priors, two-third, one-third could have been the average under both Chicago and not Chicago. What we're going to do instead is just do the next thing that someone should have thought of, and I guess we did, um, which is that instead of asking just one agent for their population average, you ask two agents now for their population average belief. Subject to the proviso that these are two agents with two different underlying beliefs to begin with. So you ask every agent for their beliefs, just like in Prolex, Young, and McCoy, but you now ask two agents, what are your population average beliefs? So agent one, who had reported 0 0.6, 0 0.4, if you recall, we did the math and we said this agent would naturally report 0 0.695, 0 0.305. Agent two, who reported belief 0 0.8, 0 0.2, would do the averaging differently. They would report 0 0.705, 0 0.295, uh, and the trouble is, even though we don't know what the population average belief is state by state, we know that for each agent, their belief times the population average belief, the, their averaging has to equal their average. So this is just law of total probabilities. What must I be reporting for my population expected average? It's my belief that the state is state one times what the population average is in state one plus my belief that the state is state two times what is the population average in state two. If you have two equations and two unknowns, you can recover the unknowns. So you can just do the matrix inversion. So once we have from two agents, one who said 0 0.6, 0 0.4 recovered that they think that the population average is 0 0.695, 0 0.305, and this one is 0 0.8, 0 0.2, says 0 0.705, 0 0.295. We can infer that the only way these two agents could be making these two reports is if they believe that in state one, it's five, five seventh, two seventh, and in state two, the population average is two third, one third. Then we just, we now know five seven two seventh versus two third, one third. We compare to what we are seeing the population average is actually realizing to in the population and concluding the true state. Does the description of the mechanism make sense? All right. There is literally nothing in this mechanism beyond this uh, inversion step. So this would be a good time 
if, if the definition of the mechanism is not clear. All right, so more, more formally, what are you going to do? You're going to ask each agent for their belief mu i, calculate the average in the population, mu hat, select L different agents such that their elicited beliefs are a full rank matrix, elicit from each of these beliefs their conditional population, what they believe, their expectation of the average posterior beliefs in the population, alpha i, and note that just alpha i for each agent i must be mu i times the unknown mu bar. So you can just recover mu bar, the vector, the matrix of what the population averages are state by state as the inverse. You just want this matrix to be full rank, preferably you want it to be a well-conditioned full rank if you're going to do this in practice. This works. Um, the theorem then is just straightforward. Under the assumptions, the uh, population mean uh, based aggregation procedure recovers the true state almost surely. Okay. It goes, um, you can start relaxing these assumptions. So for instance, I said signals are conditionally IID. That is, uh, you're just getting a signal that is IID drawn, conditional on the state of the world. The only thing we are using about conditional IIDness is that the average belief in the population is a deterministic function of the state. You don't have to assume conditional IID. You can assume any form of limited correlation. It's the only thing you need is that a law of large numbers holds. So as pick your favorite mixing property, for instance, vanishing correlation from faraway agents. Uh, as long as you can pick up a law of large numbers from the appropriate textbook, you will get back that the average population belief is a deterministic function of state, and you can still use our theorem. Um, or we have a theorem for that. Uh, the other assumption is that uh, for any two states, as Tim pointed out, we are assuming that uh, the average belief in the population is different across states. And this, of course, ensures that we can read off the true state from the recovered mu bars. But you didn't have to ask average beliefs. You could have asked, tell me your 70th percentile, or tell me some other uh, function of the average, uh, not of the average, tell me some other function of the distribution of beliefs. And as long as you're convinced that that is different across states, and that's a deterministic thing that concentrates, you can use this trick again. No, the, the linear system is from the fact that the agents, when you ask them for their average expectation, they, they would take uh, averages. So you don't have to ask them for the expectation. You just want any statistic that concentrates. And now even in the, is it true that even the two outcome case, you kind of get more from this mechanism and that you actually can compute the new bar, whereas in the previous mechanism, you didn't get necessarily the new bar, you just got the right yeah, you, I mean, but it, uh, the mu, in some sense, you're, if you believe the assumptions of the model within this mechanism, you're seeing the mu bar for the state of the world that it actually is. Now, this mechanism will also tell you what the mu bar would have been in some other state of the world. If there are settings where that is interesting to you, then yes, you're getting more. But what you are getting more is that if you go to three states, you now have something you can actually do. Yeah, which is mu bar in each of them, and therefore, remember, surprisingly popular doesn't work for three states, or doesn't, is not guaranteed to work. You can use it, but you might get multiple surprisingly popular states, and you might. Uh, so basically, I should think of each, um, like, second order query is getting a one more conditional, yes. um, you know, your average belief. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the. Other one was just that the convex hull of the support has an interior relative, so that, that for instance, if beliefs, if the space of possible beliefs is the, the three-dimensional simplex, uh, all the beliefs in the population don't lie, a line, lie in a line, that would be problematic because then I wouldn't be able to do this matrix inversion step. Um, you don't need, it's not a strong assumption, it's a pretty generic assumption 
to just assume that uh, the, these beliefs in a population will lie in a full uh, in a full dimensional set. But um, one sort of uh, cute reuse we found on a paper that did something completely different by people at, at least Tim knows uh, pretty well. Uh, they did it for full rank extraction uh, in auctions. But uh, essentially, if as long suppose agents. So this is the like Kramer-McLean generalization. This is the Kramer-McLean generalization. So deep in there somewhere, they need uh, they need to uh, they need to prove that they can get back up to full rank, and you can just reuse the same result to say that look, even if you even if agents are seeing some signal, that is not going to give uh, the signal structure is by, by per se not going to give them to full rank, but different agents see different numbers of those signals. So you see L minus one draws of that. So we have a non-generic signal structure, but some of us might see more of those signals than others. Then again, the set of posteriors expands out to a full rank set. Um, this is sort of just, just the explanation of why, but um, yeah, all right. Now, what else can we do with this mechanism? We uh, could ask, uh, like I said, the original uh, PSM paper asked agents to vote for what alternative is likely. If I had two alternatives, I could use our mechanism as well. Elicit votes from all agents, elicit expected vote shares, and uh, then uh, as long as the population vote shares are different in the two states, you could still use uh, PMBA for the same reasons uh, as before. Okay. More Interestingly, uh, and maybe something that you might be interested in, is elicitation. So, so far I've just assumed that agents are going to tell you stuff truthfully. When we assume that people are going to tell us stuff truthfully, this works great, but uh, normally if you want to elicit beliefs, normally to elicit beliefs you actually need to observe the underlying state of the world and use something like a proper, proper scoring rule on the underlying state of the world. Because this mechanism is going to derive an underlying state of the world, you could sort of do a double scoring rule on this mechanism that then also makes it incentive compatible for everyone to report the true state. So here's sort of how it would work. You elicit, just, just the mechanism is going to run like the mechanism, so you're going to elicit beliefs from all agents, you're going to elicit expected population average beliefs from two agents. Since the population average beliefs among the all these agents, the first order agents are observed, rewarding the two agents with a proper scoring rule on the realized population average incentivizes them to report the, their true expected, the, what they actually believe to be the expected population average. So you've now got the second population averages correctly. Now you can run a PMBA, you can extract the two state, and all the agents you have elicited their first order beliefs from, you can reward their beliefs based on a proper scoring rule using the extracted state as the uh, thing you score against. And this way, uh, because I'm using an assumption that uh, the set of agents is large, so none of these agents can affect the underlying first order population average, but given that, um, Truthful reporting of beliefs is, a, a bear, is therefore a Bayes-Nash equilibrium. So you, it's not just that PMBA is solving uh, aggregation, it can simultaneously solve, uh, solve uh, incentivization. So you could imagine stronger incentive compatibility there, right? Where, so, where basically, if you look at any, if you zoom in on any agent, it's actually a dominant strategy to report to people there, right? With respect to their yeah, there's a theory about contract functions. Oh, I, I, I think the only place where I need a Bayes-Nash equilibrium is the, it's, it's, um, so it's not a dominant strategy because if I think everybody else is messing up, then, I mean, I don't know what to do, but uh, I, it's not necess no, no longer a dominant strategy for me to report my belief truthfully. Uh, so, you could imagine a different mechanism where it still is even if everyone else is I don't see how? In other contexts. Oh, in other contexts, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I couldn't, 
But, but, is it obvious that you can't do that? Is it obvious that you can do that sort of property? I, I mean, I think if you were willing to rule out, let me think. But I mean, basically, like, just imagine in a situation where any given projection, you just get like, I don't know, the prior scoring rule plus mm -hmm. some additive shift, which is a function of purely with other people's reports. I see. You see what I'm saying? Purely a function of the issue so, is that so from my perspective, when I fix the other reports, it's just some additive shift to a proper score. I see. The issue is, I think, if uh, suppose I think that everyone else is deviating in a way that even though my belief is 0 0.6, 0 0.4, I think everyone else is deviating so that this mechanism is going to be screwed and report the wrong state of the world. Now I have an incentive to deviate and report that state of the world because that's going to maximize my score. So this is the unrealized versus realized outcome. Yeah. Okay. So this is the problem with the... Uh, yeah, I was, I was thinking of the realized. Realize. So you don't actually observe. If you then later observe the state, it would be easier to pull this off. Yeah. All right. One of the things that this, going back to your question about using two beliefs or asking more people for their beliefs. In the baseline mechanism, there's no reason to. If you have L uh, agents, you can elicit it from them and be, you know, go home happy. But if you think that agents are actually not hyper-rational in the sense that they perfectly know exactly what's going to happen in the population, they actually just have noisy estimates of population averages, then you can still get this mechanism to work by taking population averages or by, by asking many people the higher order question and averaging over that. If that higher order estimate is more sort of reliable for some concentration region, um, so the model here um, describes, uh, we have a model of sort of agents have just misspecified beliefs about the population average, so they just have errors. But those errors cancel out or in aggregate, then you can just, instead of doing Instead of asking two agents for their population aggregates, for instance, you could ask two sets of la two large sets of agents for their population aggregate. Even though no individual agent knows the correct population aggregate, the average will give you a reliable uh, outcome. And, and this is actually what we're going to use in practice in a second. Okay, so this works great. Uh, this allows us, actually this can be generalized further so we can handle even uh, some agents who are partisan and so on, uh, but we're still working out exactly what we can handle. So I, I in, a, in, a, in a highly optimistic move, the final sentences of your abstract that were circulated to you promised you things that you're not going to get today, but I promise they will be there at some future point in the paper. Okay. Malash, is that related to like, I think it's totally unrelated to your model, but, yeah. but behaviorally there's, it, it's definitely newly popular in political survey to ask these higher order questions. Yeah. With some kind of theory, I'm not sure there's a lot of evidence here, but there's some theory that you like report more honestly. It's almost like a list experiment style idea, but different where it's like, I, see. I won't tell hard. you my real belief, but if you ask me what I think other people believe, I'll actually reveal something more truthful about myself. Yeah. yeah. It's a, I think it's completely different from your model, but it sounds like it could be related to this idea about Partisanship. No, I, 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 so I, I saw that, uh, I, I think I saw sort of the press on that uh, last year and I don't have, uh, it gives me hope that again, that these things, one of the pushbacks we got when we started talking about this is yes, but population averages who and you know, people might be able to tell you their beliefs, but who in their right minds would have any meaningful information about population averages. And uh, I, I mean, that sort of thing gives me hope that there is meaningful information that people are finding. So it's, uh, it's, it's sort of, yeah, you're right. It's outside my model, but it's sort of, it's more like evidence that we are finding that groups of experts not just know what they know, but they also have some meaningful information about what others know. This paper is just taking it just to its limit and saying, what could you do with that? Um, and you can do a lot. Um, so here is sort of, uh, yeah, so a concern that you might have um, is that this is trying to do too much with very noisy data. So you're trying to invert a matrix based on elicited stuff 
about expected population average beliefs. Maybe we're just asking for too much. Maybe just the surprisingly popular is just more robust in some sense. So how well does this mechanism work in practice? Um, the uh, authors, uh, the original authors are delightful in the sense that they both um, in the original paper promised that they would make their data available to anyone and then actually followed through on it, um, which unfortunately is not super common in uh, the social sciences. Um, it is also true, by the way, that, um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the, uh, so here are the studies that they ran. So they ran three sets of studies. In study one, they ran a state capital study. So what did they do? They told a bunch of respondents, uh, here is this prompt, X is the capital, uh, st uh, capital of state Y. So Chicago is the capital of Al Illinois. Uh, Birmingham is the capital of Ili Alabama. 50 states, they ran a bunch of surveys. Every uh, responder had to respond with true and F, uh, with whether they think this is true or false, and also respond with their predicted population average. In each case, they also elicited a confidence. So this is not just true or false, this is how confident I am in that. So they're not exactly running the study I would like to run, but we haven't run our study yet. The second study was general knowledge. So uh, respondents were given general knowledge statements of the form, you know, just a fact about the world. Uh, Japan has the highest life expectancy in the world. True or false, or you know, uh, Zaire, uh, the I don't know, some some they pick an African country and name the capital. Do you think it's true or false? Things like that. Uh, again, same thing. Response with true or false and predicted population average. Uh, study three, they had they collected a bunch of pictures of lesions, and um, they knew they had they already knew from the case files of those lesions lesions, whether those lesions were benign or malignant. So in all three states, the experimenter knows the underlying ground state, the true underlying uh, state of the world, and they need to know this so that they can actually evaluate the mechanism. Uh, so here it's slightly different, and this, is, this one's going to be slightly trickier for us to handle too. So they asked a bunch of dermatologists, they showed them the lesion, and they asked them, uh, was it benign or was it malignant? Uh, do you think this if you, someone presented to you with this, is it benign or malignant? On a one to six scale, one is benign, six is malignant. Also, they asked, what do you think other dermatologists would say? So one is like, everyone will agree that it's completely benign. 11 is complete, everyone will agree that it's crazy malignant and scales are in between. Now these are scales, so that's tricky, but that, that's, that's life doing lab work. Um, in each case, we know the truth of the world. We have the elicited data. They compared majority and surprisingly popular. We can throw in um, uh, our mechanism, which um, so I just want to sort of highlight the numbers. So there are 50 states. I know this because I passed my citizenship test a while back um, of capitals. And um, so majority, for instance, does really poorly. So the majority of uh, applicant, the majority of elicited things for a given state matches up with the true capital of that state only 62% of the time. Surprisingly popular does really well. It, it gets back 90% correctness. So 90% of the time, even though the majority does not know the state of the world, the surprisingly popular answer is indeed the state of the world. When we ran our mechanism, we got close to surprisingly popular. So even though we are doing something slightly more intensive on the underlying data, um, we are close to surprisingly popular. This is general knowledge. Again, there were 68 general knowledge questions. Majority did basically a little better than a coin toss. Uh, surprisingly popular did way better than a coin toss. Uh, uh, PMBA does uh, close to uh, surprisingly popular. The dermatology study, now the majority is trained professionals. You'd expect them to be good. They do reasonably well, 63%. Um, surprisingly popular does significantly better, 71%. Uh, PMBA doesn't quite uh, perform as well and sort of part of it as we think is the issue with dealing with the scale. So we have several difficulties with the study, They're not difficulties with their study, but difficulties with using their study data for our things. So I mean, 
I should really just do my own experiment and show off, but uh, instead I'm just going to tell you that it's awesome. We were quite excited when we just finished doing this like last week and uh, got PMBA to perform close. So for instance, note a few things. One, we are still in a two-state world. So this is the best possible world for the surprisingly popular mechanism. We of course are theoretically as good as surprisingly popular even in the two-state world, but we're dealing with real-world data. So this, so we'd hope that in a three-state or a four-state question uh, elicitation, we could do better. Note also that the original experiment elicited votes and not beliefs. So we, what we're doing when we do PMBA is we are taking all the people who said true, then using their confidence scores as their beliefs on the state being true, averaging that out, averaging their second order beliefs out. So this is sort of PMBA, the robust version where you average in a population to try and get a better estimate. And this is the one that performs the best. We ran a bunch of others, for instance, the med taking the median average, median expected population average, or taking sort of uh, max. Uh, did this, this one seems to perform the best and seems to perform the closest to surprisingly popular. Um, there's some other theoretical niceties that you can prove in this population. So going back to your question about why not ask agents the prior, uh, sort of one of the epistemic things in game theory is priors are just modeling devices. People don't know priors, people know posteriors. But if they're hyper-rational agents, they can't just, they could just not just tell you their posterior, they could tell you their posterior about everyone else's posterior. They could tell you their posterior about everyone else's posterior about their posterior. And you could construct an infinite hierarchy of beliefs. In theory, you could just ask everyone to elicit this entire hi hierarchy of beliefs. So two things. One, if a, even if a finite set of agents reported their entire hierarchy of beliefs, you have a mechanical procedure by which the posterior you would result in is the same as the posterior you would have gotten if you knew the prior and you just saw the signals directly. So you, can, you don't need to know the prior per se. Knowing the infinite hierarchy of posteriors is sufficient even in an arbitrarily correlated world, even with a finite set of uh, agents. Also, the converse is not true. So if a you cannot guarantee that you could converge to the pooled information posterior of a sort of Bayesian aggregator who knows the prior for any finite thing. So in finite populations, all we can promise is sort of you could do our mechanism, you can do something reasonably good based on sort of your laws of large number bounds, and conversely, knowing higher order beliefs probably would not be super useful unless you knew the whole whole set. Um, there's a whole bunch of literature on this. I've, I've, I've cited sort of uh, select. It's, it's another small uh, community that uh, has crossed over into the EC community. Uh, so this idea of using higher order beliefs has of course been used in aggregation. It's also uh, the further back idea was actually to use this for el elicitation. So uh, the Bayesian truth theorem was by the same author and based on the same uh, idea, uh, and, and that's been generalized substantially. More interestingly, this set of mechanisms has also been successfully used not just in the lab, but also in practice. So uh, Rigol, uh, for some, and Roth, for instance, uh, actively take uh, these kind of peer prediction mechanisms to um, the field in India and use it to find out, use poll micro-entrepreneurs on what micro-entrepreneurs think is the best, uh, which of them should be the best one to get the loan, but also pull them for their higher order beliefs and use that to, uh, and they find that when they, um, I think my understanding of the findings is using that to allocate funds works better than like random allocation or using beliefs. So uh, this, this sort of thing seems to have some hope for actually working, and that's sort of why I got interested. I will stop early in the interest of time. So. so I guess like the big question is the feasibility of considering sort of higher order beliefs in practical settings. Mm -hmm. And I think your point that like in some contexts there are these examples where 
that seem to be doing it. Uh, yeah. Just think about like the blockchain setting. Like, so, so the, I, I guess I, I figure, I think, you know, if you, if you think of like a community of people who actually like, you know, suppose uh, go back to like the DeFi lending thing. So there's a bunch of us who have to evaluate loans. And I kind of know, I know that I evaluate, I don't know, uh, marketing projects well, but I know you evaluate technical projects very well. And I get a signal, when I look at the project, I think the technical is weak. So I now have some information potentially on how I think you will evaluate the project. So in a, in a community of experts who maybe knows each other a little bit or knows sort of stuff about the rest of their community or it's a repeated setting where they know each other's evaluation schemes over time, uh, you, you would imagine that they'd have some information about how other people might vote. Um, so that, that's one hope. The other one is, by the way, this, I mean, again, you know, I, I only have, so these are entrepreneurs who knew each other. They were from the same community, so it worked. Uh, this lab was a purely, you know, you, classical social science lab experiment. Bring a bunch of students. Uh, this was dermatologists. Uh, bring them into the lab. They don't know each other. It just, it, it seems to work. Now, has this can we scale this? I have no idea. Uh, it would be interesting to try. And you're saying, despite the fact they're in no position, they're like computer posterior because they don't know the information structure. Yeah. They, they, I mean, they don't, I mean, you, I, I can't imagine that then you had a posterior, but they're giving numbers that seem to meaningfully average to something that we can use. Um, and, and I guess, yeah, and, and going back, it seems like, it seems like there is information, our, people seem to have meaningful information about out there about what they think population averages are. People seem to be more willing to share that, uh, even than their own, star, than their own beliefs. Uh, so uh, finding ways to harness that is probably uh, useful and interesting. My impression is there, uh, this is like some new stuff I saw on yeah. political science Twitter, so take okay. 10 grains of salt. There's some, the people are really bad at, at self-reporting confidence levels. Uh -huh. They seem to perceive some, I think, Average people very reasonably like I told you to answer the question, so yeah, I'm confident in it. And they don't carry a lot of meaning with it, but when you ask them the higher order thing, they reveal that they have a lot less confidence in the I answer. Yeah. And that's part of why I think survey people are starting to like it a lot. Yeah. Because it seems like we have all these crazy things in politics where people insist things that are pretty clearly false or true, and yeah. we think it might be fake performance. Yeah. And when they answer these higher order questions, they seem to stop performing. And so they'll admit that, like, well, actually, most people probably don't think it's probably true. Don't it probably isn't. But so I should have I should have had one more column here. So because they elicited confidence, they use they could actually do something called confidence weighted majority. Confidence weighted majority sort of robustly the ro sort of on average, just barely outperforms majority. Sometimes does worse for the reasons that you're saying. So that, that's sort of why basic, I mean, that's sort of the call for, you should do something else other than majority. Um, and, and confidence doesn't seem to help. But yeah, I, I, it is a, it's an interesting question on how do you sort of robustly harness something that you'd be willing to, um, uh, you know, you'd be willing to bet money on that this works. I can only tell you that this, this promises, this has promise. Can you explain why the right and popular methods are more relevant to be especially well in the first line then? As opposed Sorry? To, so in the first line, yeah. they do extremely well, they do well in the right. The first one seems to be more I I don't, I don't have a good sense. Um, you know, maybe the only thing is sort of these were all these are all American. Uh, so this, this has tricky things to do with parsing the data because it's a one to six score and so on. This is a straight up true or false question. And it's um, American lab candidates in ask, being asked questions about America versus sort of global general knowledge questions. So maybe they just have a lot more information about what other people think about the country. Um, so maybe it's a statement of they, their higher order beliefs are actually more informative, whereas here, it's not just that I don't know the answer, I also don't know really what other people know, so everything is ill-conditioned when I start doing inversions, yeah. Um, is there some like information theoretic sense in which like this PMDA is like optimal, or like 
It's like upper bounds are no like the benchmark. In, uh, you'd have to. So in some sense, it the. In the following, this isn't a hard theorem, but in the following sense, if you buy the assumptions of the model, um, we know that you cannot do anything with just uh, with just first order beliefs. We are asking sort of l times l more information. We know we can't do anything with anything less than that. So we are as asking the least amount of questions you could possibly ask and get a guaranteed answer that is within the model guaranteed to be correct. So that's the sense in which this is information theoretically optimal, I think. But that's not a formal answer. That, that's just saying we're asking very parsimoniously few questions relative to uh, what other information is out there that these agents have. We could have done sort of, you know, you could, if, if you really were brave, you, I, I could ask you about your beliefs, about my beliefs that your beliefs are about, you know. Uh, but that only happened in Dr. Strangelove. And, yeah. All right. Thank you.